So Dan, first of all, just just tell us how far this documentary goes in in detailing the allegations. Well, what Wade and James told me on camera was very, very graphic indeed. And so we had to think very hard about how much of that we put in the film. But I think you know, we had to confront people with what child sexual abuse really means. It's not, you know, kissing and cuddling and, and slightly inappropriate intimacy. It's full on sex. It's the kind of sex that adults have with each other, consenting adults. So um, we thought we had to draw a line between the kind of image that Michael portrayed of himself as this sort of childlike, you know, a child in a man's body and what was actually happening behind closed doors. Because in the court case we mentioned, he, he ran the defense that he had basically, yes, he had slept in the same bed as quite a number of children, but nothing went on. And your contention is, yes, it did. Yeah. And, you know, there was no one else in the room. So we, uh, we and, and Jackson denied it strenuously, as you said, during his lifetime. We've included those denials in the, in the program because we thought it was important to, to have Jackson's side and his lawyers and what have you. But, um, you know, I, I found Wade and James's testimony very, very compelling. Their families are in it. You know, the, the revelation of the abuse many, many years after the fact has devastated these two families. And it's very difficult to fake that, I think. And, and again, from the documentary, we have a sense of the guilt of the mums in particular. Mm. But it just defies belief that they could be in the hotel where this is going on. They've been bought a suite by Jackson and they allow their seven, eight, nine-year-old son to stay in his room overnight. What do they think was going on? Well, Jackson, like, like all you know, successful paedophiles, grooms the family. He groomed the families, he groomed the mothers. And he told the mothers how lonely he was and how he didn't have a childhood and made them feel very sorry for him. And, and they had sort of adopted him. They brought him into their home, they cooked for him, you know, <laughs> washed his clothes and, and treated him like a son. And all the while, of course, he was trying to get access to their little boys. Let's just have a look at uh, Taj Jackson, who's Michael's nephew, spoke to Channel 5 yesterday and denies that this went on. So listen to this. You know, sleepovers, I know that, like what, they, what it sounds like. I'm not stupid. I know what that sounds like, but I also know what it was. And to me, sleepovers were watching Three Stooges, Little Rascals. You know, we'd, we'd literally watch that until we fell asleep, you know. And sometimes we'd fall asleep and, and then he would be on the floor when we fell asleep. Other times we'd fall asleep and we'd wake him up <laughs> and then he would go on the floor. But he, that's all it was. And everyone that's been around that has said that. So, so he, he says that it was just fun. Right, well it may have been just fun for him. Um, and he and, was in the room. Well he wasn't in the room with Wade or James or any of the other boys that have accused Michael of sexually uh, abusing them. I mean, you know, this is something that, th this was an image that Michael worked very hard to, to establish in the, in the mind of the public. And it was a, a pretense that he you know, went to great lengths to maintain. What, one of the problems for, for your case or their case is that when Jackson originally got into trouble with, mm. with allegations, both Wade and James said nothing happened. And they yeah. said it in a way, in a legal affidavit. So in other words, they, they put on the record that they had never been touched. Now they've reversed it. Well, that's that's really a big problem, the, isn't it? It's really what the documentary is all about. And that's why it kind of takes four hours to unpack this stuff. What a lot of people don't understand, what I didn't understand when I took on this project, was that men who've been sexually abused as children keep that secret. They hold on to that silence, partly out of shame, partly out of fear, often also out of a, a deep love and a, and a connection with the abuser, and that's a very sad and difficult thing to acknowledge. And that was the case with Wade. When Wade took the witness stand, he was defence witness number one, and he defended Michael passionately and vigorously. He didn't want his mentor, his friend, his former lo lover, sexual partner. Choice of words is difficult in these situations. Sure. Um, he didn't want him to go to jail. He wanted to save Michael. He was glad to be able to help save Michael. And it wasn't until Wade had a son of his own that he realized that the nature of his relationship with Michael Jackson had been sick, it had been abuse, it hadn't been healthy. It wasn't a, a loving relationship, it was an abusive one. Well, Lucy over here is not just a psychotherapist, but a Michael Jackson fan. So how does this leave you feeling? Well, I, I mean, I, all power to you for telling the stories of these boys, really, because certainly I've worked with people who've been sexually abused, and that is the most powerful and transformative thing, is being able to feel that you are heard, that you are finally heard, mm. not just by outside people, but also by yourself, so that you can hear your own story and come to terms with it. But I am also capable 
of holding two apparently contradictory things in my own head, that there is this extremely disturbed behavior and you know a, a pattern of, of alleged abuse and an amazing output of incredible music that personally touched me in a very um, powerful way at a very pertinent time in my life when I was just becoming, um, just leaving school, I was going traveling on a gap year. And as a result, when I hear those songs, particularly the three that you played, very early Jackson music, that just fills me with great pleasure and joy. Even so, now? Uh, even now. Right. So I feel that I, I don't, I, I think it's very dangerous to get down, down the road of a sort of tortured genius, the sort of, you know, that just sort of victimize uh, Michael Jackson. It, we have to acknowledge if it's true that there are some really hideous things that happened, but at the same time, it is possible to separate the art from the art. And I speak as a novelist as well. The novels that I write, once I've written them, they are out there and they are no longer mine. They are received by a public in a completely different well, way. 